Hello, everybody. Hello, Icons. It's Sean Kokoska, founder of Icon Coaching. Now, today is February 7th, and our February icon is none other than Brent Gove. Now, guys, this, this guy is crushing it. All right. He's absolutely crushing it. He's got $125 million in sales volume last year. He's the author of two real estate sales books that he's going to tell you about here in a second. And today's webinar, well, frankly, it's all about you. All right. The reason I do this is so that you have an opportunity, a, a venue to go to, to ask questions from people that have been there and done that. Now, let's face it, the smart people gang, they learn from their own mistakes. I've certainly made a lot of them, right? The smarter people, though, they're going to learn from the mistakes of others. They're going to analyze the information in front of them, and they're going to say, I'm not going to do what just happened to that person, right? Now, I think the smartest people of all, and you're one of the smartest people of all because you're here. I think the smartest people of all, they study the successes of other individuals. So, Brent, it's uh, such a pleasure to have you here, buddy. Why don't you just tell the, the group a little bit about Brent Gove, how'd you get into real estate, how long you've been in real estate, tell us a little about your, about your team, and do it in under 90 seconds. Okay. I got in real estate about, so, 1996. A friend of mine called me. I was 30 years old. He said, hey, you should get your license. You'd be great. So, I did, and I was not great. I struggled. I think I sold three homes the first six months. And then I uh, got some great advice from my first broker. He's like, hey, get people in your car, just will it to happen, find a way to go show property, don't wanna make offers. That worked, sold 18 homes my second year, 28th and 48. From there, uh, got involved with Remax for 12 years, loved it, um, built a team. I think my second year I went to 112 sales from 48 by leveraging through staff and technology and marketing. And then uh, built that up to about 400 sales a year by 05, 429 to be exact. And a Remax told me it'd be the worst decision I ever made, but it ended up being a really good one for me. And uh, then I went ahead and moved on to, after eight years at uh, Keller Williams, I moved on to EXP Realty about two years and three months ago. And uh, just, I've enjoyed all three companies immensely. Fantastic. So Brent, tell us a little bit about your team. Uh, currently, I run a team with uh, six buyer uh, listing specialists and uh, 12, I have 12 uh, buyer specialists. I have full, four full-time staff and I have um, two runners, two part-timers. So that, that is my team, how it functions right now. Fantastic. Um, do you mind if we talk a little bit about compensation models? I'm curious. Yeah, sure. Fire away. Yeah, I think a lot of the people on this webinar right now are thinking, well, I do want to expand through people, yet frankly, I don't know how to do it. I don't understand how to develop these compensation models or, you know, let's say I'm going to go on a 50-50 split, which seems to be the go-to for most people. Um, what value do I provide to them? So let's first talk a little bit about compensation models and, and let's talk specifically to your buyer's agents. What are you doing there? Okay, as far as um, what I do for my buyer's agents, I, same thing for everybody. First year, it's a 50-50 split. Second year, it's 60-40. Third year, it is 70-30. Fourth year, it is 80-20. They sign a commitment to work with me for four years or we don't even start. And it um, doesn't matter how many homes they sell, it's 50-50 the first year. And then I just progressively bump them up every year. I do not lead generate for my agents. I have zero cost for lead generation. That's why within four years I can pay them very well because I don't have a lead generation cost. I'm gonna change the location I'm at and walk. A bunch of people came in here. I'm in an office complex and uh, I'm gonna move. Fair enough, buddy. <laughs> all right, we're, we're losing Brent as he walks here. Yet, um, so, so I want you all to, to recognize what he just said. So it's 50-50 the first year. Now, second year he goes 60-40. Third year, he goes 70-30. Fourth year, he goes 80-20. So this is a retention-driven compensation model, meaning the longer you're with me, the more money you're going to make. So uh, Brent, as you get situated there, uh, I want you to just know and recognize that we've developed some significantly different compensation models here at Icon Coaching. I, I think one of the biggest frustrations that realtors engage with is you know, they, they, they get a team member or two or three or five, and they start pouring into them. They're adding value to them through education, 
through training, right, to really improve their skill set so that they can be very successful in the industry. Now, of course, this individual, they go in and they, they begin to crush it and they, they think, well, that's because of me. They get drunk on the wine of their own success and then what do they want to do? They want to leave you, right? And realtors right. say to themselves, well, the greatest compliment somebody can pay me is to join my team, learn so much, and then go out and succeed on their own. Come on, give me a break. I don't think any one of us feels that way, yet that's what we tell the world when it happens to us, right? So I think we've got to leverage compensation in such a way that we can put the golden handcuffs on people, encourage them to stay, and the longer they stay, the more money they make is Brent's model. Uh, uh, I, I've got a model called net profits interest compensation for super talented leadership positions on your team. And by the way, if you're curious about that, just send me an email. I'd love to share it with you. Uh, just send it to Sean at Sean I'll go ahead and type it in the chat bar for everybody here real quick. All right, Brent. So you're in a better location. Actually, your signal seems a heck of a lot better too. You're a little bit choppy there. So I'm glad you were able to move. And I love that fire extinguisher right over your left shoulder. It's perfect. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Okay. So um, let's talk about listing specialists. How are you compensating them? Uh, same way I compensate all my agents the same. First year, 50 50. Now, of course, my listing specialists, um, they do buyers as well, but I basically get a lot of leads for listings. And uh, at the time before I was in the EXP, I would carry 18 to 28 listings myself. At all times, I tried to make sure all my listings were 400,000 plus. So when you get the little stuff down at 200, 250, 300, I would have my six listing specialists do that. They were the best agents on my team. I, even though they were on 80, 20s, because by the time they were the best, they'd been with me four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. some of them 12 years. So it's really powerful retention. They know exactly what they're doing. It doesn't boomerang back. They get great service. They were on 80-20s, I'll be honest, but when I give them the listing, it's a 50-50. So whenever I give people a client, it's 50-50. I don't do lead generation, so it's we're going to partner. I say, I'm going to partner with you on this listing. We're going to split the profits 50-50. Now, any referrals that come off of this, you can have an 80-20. So they thought it was a fair deal. Internet leads, sign calls, family, friends, coworkers, go ahead and take it on your 80-20. But um, so that's how I pulled that off and still was profitable. Awesome. Awesome, Brent. Okay. So I asked you earlier, I said, if there were just three things that these people can take away from their investment of time with you and I, what would they be? And the first thing on your list was my favorite word, leverage. Leverage. Talk to me about leverage. What does it mean to you and how do you apply it in your life to increase your production and profit? Well, it's the first thing I thought of when you said, you know, what would you want everyone to know? It's the first thing I thought of, and obviously for you too, it's the most important. I, I went to a real estate conference in 1999. I taught about, I, I was doing 48 sales a year. I was working 60 hours a week. I made $393,000. It was great pay, almost 400000 a year. But I was matched. I'm like, how does anybody sell 70 or 100? I had this one couple at Remax that were for Remax at the time. They're knocking down like 185 sales a year. I'm like, how do they do that? So I decided to go work for them as a buyer's agent on a 50-50 split. And even though I was making 393000 a year, I go, I'm going to give up 200000 a year just to know what they know. And so I uh, ended up meeting with them. And fit. Um, I'm not Mr. Perfect, but this guy swore so much in an hour. He must have dropped the F-bomb four times. I'm like, I just can't do it. I can't do it. So fortunately, I went to a real estate conference in Toronto, Canada in 99, learned how to leverage through staff. I mean, either hire an assistant or you are one. Assistants are 15 bucks an hour. And uh, by the way, that changed my life when I hired my first assistant. Single mom, she was praying to God for a job for her and her two little kids, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. I was flexible at the hours. I gave her a big list of stuff to do every day that I didn't have to do. Call the roofer, call the title company, call the mortgage broker, set up a pest inspection, blah, blah, blah. Stuff that is not rocket science work. And my income doubled, literally doubled in the first 90 days. I was so much more happier and productive. The level of service was better. I quit dropping balls. Things weren't slipping through the cracks. It was awesome. So that was leveraged by hiring an assistant. Okay, pause then, one second real quick, Brent. Okay. Uh, I, I just have to say it again because you said it so well. 
if you don't have an assistant, you are one. Yeah. <laughs> so it's leverage. See, Brent reached that natural ceiling of achievement and we all have one. Meaning you get to a position in this business that you can't work with another buyer. You can't take another listing because you can't get another hour in the day. And that's really where Icon comes in. This is our ideal client, right? Because what separates Icon from all of my competitors, gang, is that we work with the people that are at that natural ceiling of achievement, show them how to apply leverage through models, systems, technology, and people to break through that natural ceiling of achievement and achieve extraordinary success. And Brent, you're a, a shining example of just that. Way to go, buddy. So keep going. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know, I mean, what are you worth an hour? 50 bucks an hour, hundred dollars an hour, 70 an hour. Why are you doing $15 an hour work? You know, I'm a control freak. You're going to have to get over that. They'll, they'll do it better than you will. If you hire the right person, <clears throat> I will we'll tell you this, um, three months later, I was so happy with her. I doubled her pay. Um, actually, uh, um, um it, I started off part time, 20 hours a week. I think it was giving her 1200 bucks. And I gave her a raise 90 days later to 3,600. So doubling would be 2,400. So we gave her a two thirds raise, you know, so to speak. And, um, and uh, it was amazing. And then I hired two or three buyer's agents that first year. And I ended up closing 108 sales from 48 the year before to 108. When I'm like, how does anyone do? So I leveraged through buying agents and through staff. And then I kicked in marketing, and then I hired more buyer's agents and more buyer's agents. And um, I think I started hiring agents in 99. By 2005, I had 47 buyer's agents. The reason people don't have 47 buyer's agents because they think they have to provide leads. You follow the models, you gotta provide leads. I don't provide any leads. Gary Keller looked at me and said I was a freaking nut. He's like, how in the world do you have 47 buyers that you know, I could have 147. In the absence of value, then it's just about the money. And most people think your value is in the lead and the actual is so not true. Your value is in what you can share and teach people. I taught my people how to lead generate. They were so grateful they stuck around. I asked for four year commitments. I said, the first year I'm gonna teach you how to work with buyers. The second year, I'm gonna teach you how to list homes, how to sell homes. We're gonna put your name on the sign. We're gonna make it all about you. I don't have an ego. I don't have to have the Branco Real Estate Group all over town. That's another reason they like it. I made it about them. And in two years, you're gonna know what you need to know, and you're gonna make at least 100,000 a year. You won't be making anything less, because I wouldn't hire you if you're gonna make less. If you're good, you're gonna make two or 300,000 a year. And if you're a rock star, you're gonna to wanna to make four or five, 600,000 a year, like me. And I said, I gotta be honest with you, so in two years you're not gonna need me. There's gonna be a propensity to wanna to wanna to leave, to go on your own, to get a big pay raise. I'm not willing to train you to have you leave in two years. So it's a four-year commitment. You gotta meet me halfway, 50-50, and it's a two-way street, not a one-way street. I don't wanna be the cow you milk for two years and leave. So you're gonna stick around for two years, and in four years, if you want to go, go. But each year, I'm going to give you a bump. 50-50, second year, 60-40, then 70-30, then the fourth year, 80-20. Then I would say to him, Sean, Sean, but I got to warn you, I have a secret hidden agenda. And my plan is, at the end of four years, to make you so happy that you don't want to go anywhere. I'm just going to be straight up. I'm threatening you with happiness and joy. And they laugh and they sit back. I have so many agents that have been on my team for seven, eight, nine, ten, and one for 12 years. I've done really well. I've had zero attrition in three years. Um, I came to eXp two years, three months ago with 18 agents. I now have 23. I had one agent retire, so I don't call that attrition because she didn't go to another company. She retired. But 100% um, retention, zero attrition. That's a whole other topic. But did I answer the question there? I, I think you did a remarkable job. Actually, I loved the response. So, so what you're doing is you're future casting, you're setting expectations, you're being transparent saying after two years, you're going to have the propensity to say, I want to leave. I want to go out on my own. Uh, so you're really future. It reminds me, by the way, of a buyer agent who once a contract is signed with a buyer, gives them like a prescription bottle where they've removed the label, they put jelly beans inside and they put a new label on that says, in the event of buyer's remorse, take two of these and call me in the morning, right? So in essence, you're anticipating what the thoughts of your 
agents are going to be. And then you're, you're uh, just setting the appropriate expectations and getting, building a team, managing buyers, managing listings. It's nothing more and nothing less than setting and then managing the appropriate expectations. So Brent, impressive, buddy, impressive. Now, uh, one other thing that really stood out to me in your model that's different than what I've seen in other models is, um, and I, I liken it to like Keller Williams, very successful organization. EXP, very successful organization. The reason for that is because they are an agent-centric model. And Brent, what you did is you said, okay, success leaves clues. I'm going to be a team member-centric model where you're adding value to them through education, you're training them. And what you're doing through training is you're really educating them. And, and the easiest way to build trust and loyalty with people is through education. When we teach them something, they automatically trust us. And then what you're doing is you're really leveraging that for longevity. And it, it's impressive, buddy. It's, a, it's a, a breath of fresh air, quite frankly. All right, so what other points might you say about leverage? Well, you know, like you said, um, every, all my agents would say, yeah, I'm on the Brent Gove Real Estate Group. Love it, Brent's amazing. But if you look at their cards, it's the Robert Lewis group. It's the Andrea Parker and Associates. By the way, she lives in Austin now. Her first year, she sold 59 homes, following my model, and she made $188,000 on a 50-50 split. Wow. She was one of 33 agents. So that if she's on a 50-50 split, I made $188,000 on one of 33 agents. That's why that year I made 3.8 million because I was leveraged. The other thing I do is I have people sign paperwork and I can get that to you, Sean. They commit for four years because memories become short over time. So I have them sign a mentoring program where I'm going to mentor them for four years. And then if I do anything unethical or that lacks integrity, they can leave that day. They're the judge. They're the jury. And I just tell them no one's ever left because they did something unethical or that lacked integrity. But I want you to feel safe making a four-year commitment to me. But I want you to take this paperwork. Plus, this is a very important point. Plus the commission split, year one, year two, year three, year four, where it goes 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20. And I, I want you to, and then kind of how we function as a team, take this paperwork home and pray about it. If you go to church, talk to your pastor about it, synagogue leader, whoever you respect, if you're not a church person, whoever. But I want you to think about it, pray about it, and think about it for a week. I, they go, no, 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 I'm ready. I want to sign out. I want to be here tomorrow. Nope. You're going to think about it for a week. This is a big, big commitment you're making. I too am making a big commitment. And I'm sorry, you'll have to wait a week. I do not want you to rush into this. Talk to your spouse, talk to your husband, talk to your wife, talk to anyone. This is a big deal. If you were to leave my team in a year or two, we're like a family, and it would be very detrimental to the team. And so I'm hiring you because I know, like, and trust you. I think you're competent. I've disc profiled you. You're a high I, high D. That's the only person I hire for to be on my team. I don't hire high Ds. They want to leave in a year or two and go take over the world. It has to be high I because they love being on a team. And high D, because they got enough to get it done. S and C low. I want low S and C. I want my employees to have S and C. That's how I do it. And the huge thing there is I hire people I know, like, and trust. In other words, would I like to hang out with them in the Caribbean or Maui? We go to the Maui every year. We go to the Caribbean every year as a team. I just brought 57 people to Maui for 10 days. Played golf, made sandcastles on the beach with our kids. We have community. We love each other. That family, we're tight. We're very tight, and my agents don't get recruited because ain't nobody taking them to the Maui for 10 days every year. This year, we're going to the Caribbean. The boat we're going to be on is 20,000 a couple. I'll probably bring 80 people this year on that trip. Oh, my gosh, how do you afford it? I can get them the two-story suite with the grand piano that costs 20 grand. People will pay 20,000 to go on the allure of the seas, whatever. Amazing boats through the Royal Caribbean. It'll cost me 1,500 a couple. And so it, you guys can all afford to do this. And if one agent leaves, it's far more than $1,500 that you're losing. But their family members or friends go, he's taking you where? To the Caribbean? Not for three days, but for seven nights, seven days. We, put, we take our business. What about your business? We put messages on our cell phone that says, hey, I'm on a trip of a lifetime to the Caribbean, to vacation of a lifetime to Maui. If this is an absolute emergency, leave a message. I'll call you back today. If this is not an absolute emergency and it can wait, please do not leave a message and call me when I get back on December 12th, on January 14th. 
nobody calls. All my agents get maybe one call in an entire 10 day period. Give it all, okay, fine. And if there is an emergency and we, we're, we're doing, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sales, people get it, but I don't want my agents working on vacation, but you guys don't leave a voicemail like that. You got all these calls you're gonna return. It's awesome. Little trick there. So I love it, Brent. That's fantastic. Okay. So tell me, um, obviously you didn't just show up one day and you had this massive success. Uh, obviously when you first started out, you couldn't afford to take anybody on a cruise and frankly, you didn't have anybody to take. So what, <laughs> what did you do to start getting traction early on in your career? Man, that's a great question. So it was 1997. I was selling HUD homes, bank repos. That's kind of what you did back in the 97 in Sacramento, Northern California. 500 moves you in. You could buy a two-story home at the pool. You have 500 bucks in a job, you're in. Now, the pool may be green. There'll be some broken windows. You got to recarpet and paint. But they were paying 5% commissions on those instead of two and a half or three. It was awesome. So I was selling about 28 of those a year. They would, um, you put in a bid, a blind bid, and then they'd open up who won. There's a company called John Brooks Realty that was beating Coldwell Banker, Remax, and Keller Williams who didn't even exist back then. So it was Century 21, Remax, and um, Coldwell Banker. And they would mop the floor with everybody. Some no-name independent called John Brooks Realty. I mean, everyone else would get 10, John Brooks would get 40. And like a month, they're doing like five, 600 of these heads. I'm like, I remember being at Remax selling 28 homes, making decent money, going, what does that company know? Again, I'm like that. I'm like, I need to quit working for Remax, go find this John Brooks no-name realty nobody's ever heard of and work for them. I didn't act on that. I thought about it. And one day I was driving down the road and I saw all these signs like Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs. Like most people put a sign out, a little white and blue Cobalt Banker balloon or red and white Remax balloon or Keller Williams thing, right? They had, they must have had sign after sign after sign after sign after sign after sign after. They must have had 10 signs, four feet tall, three feet wide, bright orange, you know, free list of homes in the area, 500 moves you in, open house. And by the time I get to the corner, there wasn't one or two signs, there were two on each corner. There were eight signs at the intersection that were like five feet tall, three feet. I'm like, what the heck is this? I turned left. I'm not even, I'm an agent showing property. I went to the dumb open house. And then boom, 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 buried in the subdivision. I get there. There's people upstairs, people downstairs, people in the front yard, people in the backyard. There's 30 cars packed out. It's complete freaking chaos in a zoo. I'm like, what is this? It was John Brooks Realty. And I realized they draw all the traffic from the signage. What I do, copy them immediately. Immediately, I doubled my production from 28 to, well, it's not doubling, but 48. And then I taught my two or three buyers agents how to do it. We went to 108, then we went to 180, then we went to 240, then 280, then 340, then 4, 429, 169 million in sales. Just copying John Brooks Realty. And in 99, I learned how to leverage. I copied a successful Remax agent, number one in the world. And so all I've ever done was copy success. I haven't really invented anything. And um, you don't have to spend money on marketing dollars to generate. To answer the question, I'm not get off topic, but I hope that was helpful. Absolutely. Um, so on your open house signs, by the way, you write about this in your latest book called Momentum, right? On your open house signs, it says free list of area homes. Tell me about that. What are you doing there? It's huge. You know, it cracks me up. All these years, 40, 50 years, we put Century 21 on the sign. We put Remax on the sign. We put Keller Williams. We put Coldwell Banker. Nobody gives a rip about your company. Do you really, if you're in Miami and you see a sign that says Coldwell Banker, is that why you went to the open house? No, you went to the open house because it said open house. Get word of the word Coldwell Banker or Remax. Get word of the word EXP and just put open house free list of area homes. Cause you ever been in an open house, this, the car pulls up and kill her. I got somebody. And then they drive slowly and they drive off because you're in a two story and they wanted a one story or you, they pull up and they drive slow. You can hear the gravel and the cord on their tires and you're in a English tutor home and they don't like that. Or you're in a modern style home and they like a more traditional home. You have brick, they hate brick and they drive away. As soon as I put free list of area homes, they start to drive away and they go, Hey, there's a list of homes in the area. Let's get that. They park and come in, park and come in. I started to get 50 to 100 agents to my open houses. I'd have so many people in the kitchen. I have to get up on the chair and say, excuse me, um, can I have everyone's attention? 
Uh, this home, I only hold vacant homes open. I said, can I tell them what we're doing here? This is a vacant home. The seller is highly motivated. Um, I publish a list, that word publish is very important, of vacant homes every Friday. One of the only agents in Sacramento that does this. You can't, people, well, I can get, why do I need you? I got Realtor.com, I got Zillow Homes. No, 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 you need me. Zillow does not publish the vacant home list. You may be going, why do I want a vacant home list? Oh, no reason. Just because the sellers are usually desperate, they're freaking panicking. They bought a new $800,000 home. They got their $500,000 home. Now they're making mortgage payments on $1.3 million. I don't care how much money they make. They write that check on for the $500,000 home that's empty for $3,200. They're motivated. So if you want to find the motivated sellers that are desperate to sell, we'll give you a great price. You need my vacant home list. You can't get that at homes.com. Red, Redfin, Realtor.com. So give me your email before you leave. I'll add you to my list. It sounds harmless, right? Wrong. So they look at me, yeah, let's give them our email. They start to fill up the little application. And I go, okay, great. I'll put you on the list. But oh, by the way, do you want just this city or do you want the neighboring city? Yeah. Do you want a single stories only or double stories? Do you want a pool? Do you want granite? And they start describing the home. We're having fun. Do you want a big lot, little lot? Do you want a view? Do you want a newer home? Do you care if it's an older home? And they're describing the dream home. They're digging it. They don't know we're building rapport. And I go, oh, by the way, what's your name? Sean Kokoska. Hi, Sean. I'm Brent Gove. At the very end, I don't say, I'm Brent. Here's my card, like most salespeople do. Put your cards away. Put the guest registration away. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. Stop it. Now, that's <laughs> me. That's me. You know, I really, and so I would, on that form, though, it's about eight and a half by 11, that big. I mean, I'm sorry, five by seven. It's on an eight and a half by 11 sheet, but five by seven. It has name, address, email, and I write down everything they want. And then I say to them, have you talked to a lender yet? Nope. Well, our lender just gave out 4.2 30-year fix. I don't know if you read, it rates around four and a half. And that's about a $30,000 difference in interest on a 30-year loan. My brokerage, Remax, my brokerage, Keller Williams, my brokerage, EXP, is teamed up with the most powerful lenders in the industry, and I have. I personally work with Guild Mortgage. And we're going to give you a ridiculously low interest rate and uh, low closing costs. If they go, well, yeah, I've already talked to a lender. I've got that set. What's your interest rate? Eh, I really don't know. You go, that's a red flag. You should know. What are your closing costs? I have no idea. I go, that's a huge red flag. Take one minute, fill out this little tiny application. I will call you Monday with your approval. And worst thing will happen, your lender that you love will sharpen his pencil and that rate you get is gonna come way down. Your closing costs, instead of being 10,000, will be 6,000. Would you like an extra 4,000 in your hand to buy some patio furniture or new uh, you know, beds for the kids or whatever? That's the worst thing that happen. You could still use your lender because my lender is gonna scare your lender. And they go, okay, they fill it out. What's on the application? I never asked for it. Are there social security numbers? I collect social security numbers at open houses. On a, rainy, on a rainy day in three and a half hours, I collected 37 sets of social security numbers. Yeah, you might, in the absence of value, people won't give you that stuff. Why did every single one accurate? I ran all their credit on Monday, and my lender said uh, 19 of them are good, the rest are junk. Bad credit, 400 FICO scores, 520, 580. I had 19 approved buyers on a Monday morning for free from people I met the day before. I call back Sean Kokoska, congr uh, congratulations, Frank Cove. I got you approved 800,000. Chase didn't do it. G uh, Guild Mortgage didn't do it. It was me because they were sitting on their boat while I was working my bazooki off on the weekend. I'm your hero. You don't talk to my lender. They don't even know who the lender is. They have authorization to pull credit, social security number, it's all, they just fill it out, man, because they want that 4.2 interest rate. Always ask for them, what's the best deal you gave out in the last three days? I gave out 4.1 30-year fix. I tell them, how's that work? I don't know, fill this out. We have a generous approval department. They're liberal in the good sense of the word, and they're generous, and we are going to get you approved. I will call you money with your approval. I don't say I'll call you money to see if you made it, to see if you made it. No, we're going to get you approved. And then, of course, what about the other 18 that didn't get approved, Brent? I asked my lender, when could they buy a home? Well, they cleaned their credit in a year. They cleaned their credit in two years. Congratulations, Sean, you're approved to buy a home in two years. I got you approved. <laughs> Told you. Now you just got to <laughs> things in and bruises on the credit, but you can buy a home for $650,000 in 24 months, and it's going to fly by. 
Would you like some coaching? Would you like us to massage your credit report and get some bumps and bruises off there? Because they know they have that. Yeah, I would. Good. I'm going to connect you with my lender. His name is Jeff Compton from Guild Mortgage. That's when they get to meet my lender. And then he fixes their credit through the credit scrubbing systems. And then he flips them back to me in two years. Everybody gets approved. I didn't say when. Some of them are in six months. <laughs> but what about the other 19 buyers? You're approved. Let's go look at a property. We killed it. I taught my agency. So if you're not collecting social security numbers at open houses, you are blowing it. And in my book, Momentum, I teach this. And if you go to my website, brentgoveresources.com, I did a 90-minute explanation of this. I mean, 3.8 million in one year doing this. 90 minute talk on lead generation is a mic drop performance and someone FaceTime lived it and it went viral. It's been seen thousands and thousands and thousands of times and it's available right now. If you go to brentgoveresources.com, I don't sell anything on the website. I have my book momentum. You have to buy it on Amazon. There's the link and my other book top dollar, but watch that thing. It'll change your life. You can take those principles, apply them this weekend and this weekend you will It'll change your life. Great work, Brent. I love it. By the way, I typed in uh, that website domain name or URL, brentgoveresources.com. All right, so we've got a couple of questions flying in here, Brent. We're going to get back to our agenda here in just a moment. Yet, uh, uh, So I'll summarize James McCloyd's question here. He says, uh, uh, you hit a major decision point to switch brokerages. Um, essentially, what... What kind of sparked that? Why, why did you jump? It was from KW to EXP. What happened? Well, I mean, I spent 20 years and I changed brokerages one time. After 12 years at Remax, I went to Keller, stayed eight years. I was never going to leave. I loved Keller Williams, greatest company on planet Earth. The reason I left is I was open-minded enough to watch a webinar about EXP. And I learned that EXP had five to 10 classes a day, more than Keller Williams, taught by the same people who used to be at Keller Williams. So the training is phenomenal absolutely phenomenal number two the second thing i learned is that they actually have a lead generation tools that were giving the agents 10 to 20 leads a month and that struck my interest the third reason is they had stock awards i spent 20 years at remax and keller williams dave Leninger had the stock he became a billionaire gary keller owns keller williams outright he's a billionaire everybody else works for remax works for keller williams at exp they have stock awards I was told the stock would be worthless in two years. It's tripled. We're now on the NASDAQ. It went from $290 to over $10 a share. And uh, we were a little higher a few months ago, pulled back, but so did everybody else. Apple lost 30%. And the, the stock market did what done the last few months. But tripling in two years and three months, I like that. I have over 40,000 shares today. So I have between four and $500,000 worth of stock. Compared to the last 20 years of zero, I like it. But really, the main reason I left was not the leads, not the training, not the stock. It was because they were a revenue-sharing company. And uh, just to put it in perspective, my first month at EXP, my revenue share check was $1,900. That was for 10 days. The next month I was there for 30, it was $5,000. The next month it was 10,000 a month. The fourth month, 10, I was disappointed. Fourth month at EXP, it's 10,000 a month, 120,000 a year. I was like, Terribly disappointed. It had doubled every month, 19, 5, 10. I was I truly expected it to be 20,000 a month, 240,000 a year by my um, fourth month. So I told my wife, and I'll end with this my fifth month, I go, baby, we will make 15,000 a month, which is pretty good. Your fifth month, what's that, times 12, you know, whatever that is, 180,000 a year. By, have that in place by my fifth month. Well, it wasn't. I always tell people, don't promise your wife something if it ain't going to happen. Fortunately for me, it was more, it was 25000 a month, which times 12. It's like 300000 a year by my fifth month. I've never made less than twenty five. And today, if I told you what I made, you would not believe me. Um, it is outrageous. So, so that's why I left. To answer that gentleman's question, it was for stock, stock awards and the revenue sharing component. And um, I referred less people to EXP than I did to Keller Williams. And so I love Keller Williams, love, love Keller, love Remax, love EXP. I got a minute. I'm a lovey dovey guy. I like, I, I blossom where I'm planted. I, nothing, Remax is great, so is Keller. This is just different. Got it, got it. And I, I happen to know that what you left off with on an annual revenue share, that now you're making in about 30 days. 
Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty awesome. Okay. Uh, so, guys, I've done a, a lot of studies of real estate firms' models, no doubt about that. Uh, I have analyzed EXP inside and out. And if you want a just a subjective, unbridled opinion of the model, I want you to send me an email. Let's get on the phone, have a quick conversation about it. Uh, I, I have asked all the questions that need to be asked and I've got all the answers that need to be answered. So if you find yourself a little bit EXP curious or Keller Williams curious or Remax curious, just drop me an email. It's Sean at SeanKokoska.com. I'll go ahead and type it in again in the chat bar and I see a whole bunch of questions coming in. All right, and click send, here we go. There's my email address. Guys, just do it now, just send me an email if you're curious. There's a couple of other questions that James had for you though. First, what's your why and has it evolved over time? Man, what's my why? You know, my why has always been to take care of my family. I have six children, uh, all boys except for four girls. So <laughs> I, have, I have a bunch of kids. I have a beautiful wife, 27 years. Um, I could cry just thinking about it. Um, you know, I'm a big family guy. Um, I learned to put boundaries in place in 2010. We had a lot of pain in the downturn. Uh, 2005 is when the market corrected in California. And, uh, and so it was a long time. And so I learned to set boundaries. When I work, I don't, I don't play. But when I play, I don't work. So I learned to put the phone in the glove box to be present on dates, to be at Little League and at soccer, actually there, not on the phone and texting, um, and to be present. So put real estate in a box, have boundaries, have a life. And uh, so my why is my family. And uh, I work really hard when I work. And when I don't work, I'm golfing. I'm going to Hawaii, the Caribbean, Palm Springs, Las Vegas, Scottsdale, just having a blast. So, a boy. All right. So why'd you decide to write the books, especially Momentum? You know, it's a great question. Um, you know, John Goddard, do you remember the, the story about John Goddard? Goddard? No, tell us. I, I don't. You know, I don't, I don't remember it perfectly, but he was a guy who like in the 1800s, late 1800s, he set a goal to do like a hundred outlandish things like, you know, drive a dog sled across the electric circle, climb Mount Everest, you know, fly to the moon. He didn't hit all of his goals, obviously, that far back. But he set some crazy stuff he wanted to do with his life, and the man uh, did like 90 of them. And so, you know, one of the things on my one thing was host a TV program, never done that. You know, but I was host a radio program. I've been on the radio for 14 years now. I'm one of the top 10 AM stations in the nation. Rush Limbaugh came from my station. Rush and I used to work together. Tom Sullivan, who's on Fox News, came from my station. Now he's on Fox News nationally. I'm still there. Whatever reason, I didn't get tapped on the shoulder. I guess I didn't quite have that talent. But the bulletproof glass is still at our station because the rest was a little controversial. Right. But news, talk, financial services, been there 14 years. So setting goals. And one of those goals was to write a book. I just wanted to write a book. I was a C English student. I, you know, struggled my whole life. I, you know, was behind in reading and math. Um, I, I was a late bloomer. Um, you know, good grades never came easy. In fact, they never came at all. But um, I did get straight A's in citizenship. My teachers loved me. I would get them donuts or whatever. They loved me. But um, yeah, so I wrote the book Momentum. And uh, by that time, I think it sold about 3,000 plus homes. And now I've got over 4,000, but um, well over 4,000, probably 4,500. I don't know. I haven't counted them. But, um, and I, I came up with seven chapters of what I had to say. And I, I wrote the book, and people love it. It's great. It's available on Amazon or brinkoresources.com too. Right. James further asks um, about the, the title chapter of one, of one of the chapters in the books, uh, Why Buyers Are Gold. How'd you come oh. up with that? Why'd you come up with that? Um, what do you mean? What do you mean? Okay, here's, here's what the common industry perspective is, by the way, is that don't work buyers. That's what most people are going to tell you. Don't work buyers because they too much, take too much time. You can't control them. You're just in for heartbreak. Listings are leverage. You need as many listings as you can possibly get, right? The second you put a sign out there, um, all of the members of your board begin to work for you to help sell the house. Well, all of those things are true. I think you can systematically work buyers. Back when I first started in this industry, I was probably the first buyer's agent on the face of the planet, systemized the process, and then closed over 100 buyer side transactions per year with several $100,000 commission months. So you know what, Brent? I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, if you, if you systemize the process, well, then you can become very successful and financially wealthy 
working buyer. So talk to us about it, Brett. Why'd you come up with why buyers are gold? Well, when I was brand new, I got a few listings by mistake, just lucked out. And the sellers, if their home's not selling, they're mean. <laughs> so I did not enjoy it. Like, why isn't my home selling? You're not doing your job. My neighbor said they did open houses last week. And where were you? I was in Tahoe. It was my anniversary. God forgive me for not doing open houses. And I'm like, I decided sellers were mean, cranky, and nasty, so I wrote them off, number one, in the beginning. People would call me to list their home. I'm like, aren't you in the pocket area? Yeah, I go, Century 21's really popular there. Just call them. I wouldn't even do the referral. I didn't want to talk to them. So I had so much fun with buyers. They cry when you give them the keys. Come over and have a, in the 4th of July. And I just, it was so rewarding. I do agree eventually you have to migrate to listings. I haven't worked with a buyer in years and years and years and years. And you will get your life back. But when you're brand new, you can't necessarily just go knock down 30, 40 listings. Some people do. That is a rare bird. Most people start with buyers. And if you're out there today and you need to make money, you can watch my video tonight for free, the 90-minute presentation I did at my local Placer County Board of Realtors. The best talk I've ever done. I sell it for $5.95. All the time, I'm giving away free at BrinkoResources.com. That's the one that went viral. And you could do my open houses this weekend. I can parachute into any town in America and kill it. And I would pick up, I'd pick up this weekend probably 20 or 30 buyers this weekend. Next weekend, 20 or 30. I'd have 80 to 100 buyers in whatever town you're in within one month. And people are like, oh my gosh, how do you work? You can't. The cream rises to the top. People call me like, Brent, this is George and my wife Wilma. We're moving here from Atlanta. We are desperate. We met you at an open house four months ago. We kept your card. We were impressed with you. We have to buy a home this weekend for $500,000. i am sorry to put that pressure on you. Could you help us? How'd you like those kind of buyers instead of the engineer types that want to look for a year? So I'm able to, because I had so many leads, I was able to work with clients I wanted to work with and take the good ones. The other thing I will say, Sean, is because I, I did what Gary Keller taught, and I want to give Gary Keller massive props for this, master lead generation. That'll solve a lot of your problems. So my record was seven sales in a month, and I got paid seven times. Pretty good. One, most people listening love to sell seven homes in a month. Well, one month I had three in escrow. It was June. One by one, they all fell out. Different reasons. I went from three in escrow to none in escrow. And I've been around about four years. I got mad. It was 1999 at myself, and I said, that's it. I'm selling 30 homes in 30 days. And like, who, I mean, who sets a goal like that? They want to sell 30 homes in the year. I'm like, you guys, under, under, you're so under, you're, you so underestimate what you're capable of. So I told everybody, I'm going to do this 30 homes, 30 days. I told my wife. Is this cool? Because I'm going to hammer it. And then you set the goal. Like, how am I going to do that? Well, I better show property every day. So every day I'm like, show somebody a house. I work so hard to do that. Sometimes I show two or three buyers a day, a home or two or three, sometimes five. Every day I'm showing property, showing property. And then you have a chance to write offers. Well, guess what? I didn't hit the goal. It was a big, hairy, audacious goal. Hey, I'm out of bed in the morning. I was focused. I'm like, what are you doing this week? Oh, I'm going to set up an open house. Maybe show property this week and maybe make a sale. That's why most agents starve. And so what I did is I said, I'm doing this, baby. And I told everybody and I worked and I failed colossally. I only sold 14 homes that month, all buyers. And um, no sales out for them. My record was seven sales in a month, which I was thrilled about. And I doubled my all-time record because I said, you know what? You're better than this. And I understood lead generation. You got to understand lead generation. So I did have the clients and baby, I was rocking and rolling. I made almost $100,000 in a single month by myself, no team, no assistant, no nothing. And that'll solve your problem real quick. You can change your life this weekend. Watch my, my video, it's how to, called How to Do Mega Open Houses. Right, right, well the bottom line is, Brent, and I say it all the time, you know, there's three metrics, gang, that you can control. And it, it seems kind of ridiculous, you can only control three things, right? Yet think about it, you can't control the buyer's credit score, you can't control the seller's cash position, you can't control their motivation. The three things you can control are what you say, what you do, and how many people you say it to and do it with, right? So what Brent's demonstrating here is he set a big goal, right? And the bigger we think, the bigger actions, bigger relationships, and bigger habits we begin to form. In essence, if Brent wants more appointments, guess what? Brent and you get to talk to more people. So the natural byproduct of talking to more people is more appointments. 
and the natural byproduct of more appointments is more contracts, and of course, more contracts equals more revenue, right? Now, of course, we're gonna do this with integrity, right, gang? Uh, we're not gonna mislead people, we're just gonna come from contribution, we're gonna add value, we're not gonna look at the wood-burning stove, kick it and say, give me heat and I'll give you wood, no, we're gonna put the wood in first, we're gonna light it, we're gonna make it burn with white heat intensity, right? So, Brent, you're demonstrating so, so well, and I gotta tell you, we have never had so many questions coming in, let me see if I can get to some of these real quick. Uh, so, when you say no lead gener generation, what does that mean? Now, it it means, means you market the properties, obviously, right? Meaning, you're not buying leads, is that what you're saying? I don't buy leads. So um, I have my agent sign. I said, look, Sean, if you're going to join my team, I want to be clear. I'm never going to give you a lead. If you're coming for, to get leads, should we stop, make a U-turn and go back? So of course I give them leads. It's called under promise over deliver. The biggest mistake people make is they say, yeah, I'll give you leads. I'll give you leads. And so then they have a buyer's agent or two or three because I don't have enough leads to have five or 10 or 23 like Brent Gove or 47 like I once did. You know, I, I don't have that. If you teach them, they're like, well, why don't they leave you? Because they made a four-year commitment. Because I hire people with integrity that I know, like, and trust. And, and I've, I've only had two people ever in 19 years leave early. And it was in the crash. Everyone was going bankrupt, losing their homes. I did have two women leave early, and everybody was hurting so bad. I didn't believe them. Most people honor that. I tell them I don't renegotiate splits ever. I don't care if you sell 100 homes. It's 50-50. And next year, 60, 40, do not ask my agents, never renegotiate these splits because I've been clear up front. I've managed that expectation. So um, I totally missed your point. I know I got, I got off topic. What was the question? Again? So you're not buying leads, right? You're, right. Not, uh, you're not promising leads to your agents. You're not, um, you know, writing a check to Zillow for 15 grand a month, right? No, it's just all pretty much organic, right? And you're teaching them how to fish instead of giving them a fish. Bingo. And, and you know uh, the old saying, gang, I mean, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him to fish, he just sits in the boat and drinks beer all day, right? <laughs> the other thing I did, Sean, was I raised them up from baby chicks. I helped them study to get their license. I, I, I didn't have any bad habits. If they had any kind of training from any other company, uh, I wouldn't take them. And, 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 and if you help them get their license, if you help them learn the business, they're fiercely loyal. Uh, my teams have always been so loyal. I'm zero attrition for years. The biggest problem you see and I see is these teams, they just churn out their buyer's agents and they're just like, they're losing people at the back. They're just like this grinding meat plant. Um, and that's a, that's a rough way to go. You're constantly rebuilding your team. That sucks. I think a lot of people get depressed. They don't like team building because of that. So um, this solves the problem. And I go out and do the open houses with them two, three times. They got it. I'm done. Take a new agent. Two, three times. They got it. I'm done. I only show up for an hour or two. I don't stay the whole time. But yeah. That's how that works. I love it. So uh, James, by the way, you're my favorite person right now. A ton of questions coming from you, buddy. That tells me you're coachable, that you want to learn as much as you possibly can, if, and certainly more than anybody else, because you're asking all these questions. Now, he says, I've heard that most teams are not very profitable. Could you address this for us? No, absolutely. Um, that's because they're spending sometimes 15, 20, 30,000 a month. I know teams that spend 50, 100,000 a month on lead gen. They have, I, I was at one point, I had 13 full time assistants. Now I, I learned my lesson. I have four now, not 13. I do this almost as much business. Um, and um, I, I pay attention to the bottom line numbers. But yeah, if it's done wrong, and it's, there's some, you have to do a little bit of chemistry. You got to, be smart, the office you get, you know, what's your overhead? What do you pay your people? What do you pay the splits if you spend too much money on lead generation? That's why people fire their buyer's agents. Like, you're not converting quick enough. And if they're spending money, 10, 15, 20,000 a month. So since I'm not doing that, I don't have to fire people. And I, because I disc test them, and if you get an outgoing person who loves people, their favorite thing to be on a team, high eyes love to be on a team, they love community. And then they've got D, they've got the cahoots for the drive to get it done. Um, that's very powerful. So, yep, that's how that works. Fantastic. Okay, uh, a couple of other questions. Here we go. Um, are there any production standards in your agreements with your team members? You know, I don't have that at all. Um, there's zero production standards for my team. Uh, some of my agents sell 20 homes a year, some sell 30. My best agent right now is 35. 
and the market ridden, uh, markets pulled back in California. That's what they do. I wish I had 10 that do 35. That'd be 350 deals a year. Um, I have some agents that sell 10 homes a year, some 15. I have some that do four, five, six, seven sales a year. We're a big family. I'm good with it. I don't spend money on my agents other than the annual trip. And um, so I, I can afford to have them on the team. If I was giving them a ton of leads, I would have to fire them. I don't like that. Um, it's just not me. I probably should let two or three go, but that's not me. So we're a family. I ain't firing grandma. So. <laughs> I love it. So um, you're in Charleston, South Carolina today. You're presenting. In fact, you came off stage to jump on this webinar. You're in Orlando tomorrow. You're in Detroit on Saturday, right? And uh, yeah, Orlando tomorrow, Detroit on Saturday. If anyone's out in those areas, you want to come say hi or attend some training, uh, reach out to me, Google me, BrentGo.com. No problem. You'll find my number. Text awesome, me. Awesome. So you're traveling all over the place. What is the expectation that the team has of Brent Gove right now? Oh, yeah. No, my, my, my team's mature. I teach them every week for an hour uh, Thursdays. I had my, one of my best agents lead the team meeting this morning. Today is Thursday. 10 to 11 Pacific hour, I pour my heart into that meeting. If you have a team, you prepare. Don't show up and just barf on them. You prepare, make it great. Maybe have a technology expert come in one week, a title expert come in the next week, a home warranty expert come in the next week, a mortgage expert, a marketing expert, a, um, a interior decorator, general contractor. So you can share the hour. You don't have to, maybe you don't have content for an hour. Sean and I can go for an hour every week, right, Sean? But um, I don't, they don't necessarily want to hear from me an hour every week. Sometimes I'll have two guest speakers. Sometimes it's me for an hour, but I am prepared. I bring it. It is good content and the absence of value your team will leave you. You better prepare. You better, I give them books every month, a new book to read. I just give them all the friendship factor by Alan Lloyd McGinnis. Next book, next month we're all reading Can't Hurt Me. If you've heard of that book, Sweeping the Nation. It's called Can't Hurt Me. I've given them Og Mandino, the greatest salesman in the world. So every month I give them a new book to read. I'm pouring into them. They love it. If they didn't, they would leave. So there's value and that's the key. How about your values not in lead generation? Teach them, but you don't have to give them leads. You can grow big if it's not all about that. Right on. So I asked you, what are the three things? The first was leverage. Now, one of the reasons you're able to travel over the place is because you have identified a leader for the sales team and you're able to then step out who's going to deal with the day to day. Yeah. Right. No doubt about it. Okay. The only thing that's going to lift the ceiling of your production, your profit, leverage. That's the only thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you also said lead generation. You want to talk about strategies, tactics to really identify leads. And then finally, you wanted to talk through retention. I think while we've touched on those last two, I don't know that we've really gotten to the points that you wanted to make. So I just want to open the floor to you and just let you, let's talk about lead generation first. What other points did you want to make? I'll say this, obviously, I'm a massive open house hound dog. Some of you are like, well, I've tried that before, I didn't, I didn't like it. Well, I tried sushi and I didn't like it the first time either, but now I love it. And, and maybe you didn't like golf, but now you love golf. Watch my DVD and go, you know what? I don't know if I want to do that, but I can give, I can have a brand new agent watch that and they can go replicate that. And that's what my agents do. Also, the DJ Shamu is radio. It's not necessarily the hour talk show I have. It has made me relatively well known in my community of Sacramento after 14 years and seven, I think 700 broadcasts for an hour on one of the top AM stations in the nation. But honestly, it's the ad I run every week. I run an ad that says, hey, if you're out there thinking of selling your home and you've been looking at the value of your home on Zillow and you're frustrated, as most of you are, because Zillow says your home's worth way more than you think it's worth, or usually they're saying it's worth this and you know it's worth more, there's a reason for that. So if you're frustrated, call me. I'll tell you what your home's actually worth. My phone rings off the hook. I have 18 to 28 listings because I run that ad where I essentially beat up on Zillow. Zillow does not know that you remodeled your kitchen, does not know that you redid your pool or even put a pool in. Zillow is just a computer-based algorithm that spits out a number in one second. And I'm telling you what, more goes into it. If you want to know what your home's really worth and you're going to sell in the next two, three, four, five, six months, call me. I will tell you what it's worth. And when they call me, well, why are you willing to do this? I go, I'll be honest with you. When you do go to sales someday and in six months or a year, or whenever you're ready, I'd like to be considered for an interview. They go, that's it, no strings attached, and I'll never know if you call me back. They'll go, okay. 
So I come over, they don't know that is the interview. I do the appraisal, I show them what I do to sell a house, I get them all fired up, I make recommendations, like great, we're ready to do this in five months. I say, great, let's take two minutes and do the paperwork now. And I know we've identified the value of your home is at 700,000. I'm gonna go ahead and list it right now at 750 for three quarters of a million, 50,000 more than your dream price. And if I get a client that moves into town that doesn't like anything on the market, I'm gonna come show them yours. And if they pay you 750, the price is non-negotiable. They either buy it for 750 or they don't. You don't have to redo your deck. You don't have to repaint the house. And you don't have to redo the landscaping. What if you can get 750, not do this list of things you want to do, get your home on the market, and then they let you stay for a year at what you're currently paying. So it was worried, well, if you sell it, we're like, oh, I'm not ready to move till next fall. How about if I set up an option for a year and you only pay for the time you use, and it's the exact payment you currently make, and it's $50,000 over your dream price, that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna go ahead and sign this paperwork now, and this allows us to happen. Otherwise, that won't happen. It's called a pocket listing, and then when you are ready in August or September, October, we'll review the paperwork, I'll actually put you in the MLS, and we'll look at the price. It could be the price has gone up to 750. Maybe it's gone down to 650. We'll adjust the price. But if you got 750 for your house, you didn't have to make all the repairs, would you be thrilled? They're like, totally. They sign the listing agreement every time. What you guys do is you leave it there, you call them back this summer, they go, oh, we decided to sell in June. We already live in Atlanta. We sold <laughs> Woo! We couldn't find your number. And I did those dumb things for over a decade until I learned through coaching, paying $1,000 a month to my coach, to someone valuable like Sean, who taught me, do not leave that peach to be picked like a Georgia peach, you sign that listing agreement, take two minutes, initial, throw the price, done, awesome. Right on. Okay, well that is great advice. And I trust some of my coaching clients that I've had this conversation with are really listening to that advice now, right? <laughs> okay, it's good stuff. Um, so do you require your agents to do a certain number of open houses per month, Brent? All right, Brent is, uh, Wi-Fi seems to, or his internet seems to be a little sluggish. So let's just wait for him to come back. Um, King, I, I think we've got to have some minimum standards in terms of performance around lead measures. Now, it's really hard to hold people accountable to number of closings and revenue. Would you agree with that? Well, I'm sure you would because there's far too many things outside their control. Or number of contracts, really hard to hold them accountable to that as well. Uh, even number of appointments, it's hard to hold them accountable to that. And if you do, here's what you're going to find is that they're setting appointments just for the sake of setting appointments with not so motivated prospects. So the one thing that I would encourage you to, en to uh, engage your accountability structure around, okay, it's the lead measures. So those lead measures are number of live conversations. Remember, it's knowing what to say, how to say it, and then say it to enough people. Even a salesperson without a ton of skill, if they talk to enough people, well, they're going to get enough appointments, enough contracts, and enough revenue to satisfy their goals, all right? So um, lead measures around number of open houses, lead measures around number of networking events or luncheons or coffees or, or whatever it is that you want to hold them accountable to. Now, by the way, the reason we choose to hold our team accountable to certain lead measures it's because we care enough about them and we want to see them achieve their goals, right? Now, um, many of you have asked, will this be recorded? Yes, it's being recorded. It's being recorded right now. In fact, we're going to send out a replay link to everybody who registered as we always, always do. So in the future, when you see an icon of the month webinar invitation come through your email, just register, even if you don't know if you can be physically present, because we're going to send you out the replay link. And of course, I'm always on the hunt for talented individuals. In fact, I'm coaching several of you right now that will be future icons of the month. We're going to demonstrate how you you're blowing it up. Um, and uh, hopefully Brent can join back in with us. There were a couple of offers I made to y'all today. First, if you're interested in compensation models designed specifically to retain talent to your team, I want you to send me an email at sean at seankokoska.com. You can see in the lower left hand of the computer screen, that's how you spell my name, S-H-O-N at S-H-O-N-K-O-K-O-S-Z-K-A.com. Just send me an email. If you are uh, curious about the things I've learned from Brent and some others that are, that are really crushing it at eXp, 
uh, in a unbiased um, broker agnostic conversation. If you want to just hear what my investigation has revealed uh, about EXP or about Keller Williams, as many of you know, I was with the Keller Williams organization at a very high level for a good number of years. I understand the models inside and out. So again, if you're curious about either of those, please send me an email, sean at seankokoska.com. Be happy to have that conversation. So I've got two o'clock right on the nose. I know we didn't get to all of your questions and I was really hoping Brent could join back in with us. As you know, he's traveling today. He's presenting in uh, Charleston, South Carolina right now. In fact, he just ran off stage to add value to each and every one of us. So until we see you again, you guys, uh, oh, one last offer. You know, if you're a little bit stuck and you're serious about moving your business forward, if you want somebody to talk you through some of your current challenges, uh, let's, let's face it. Sometimes we cannot read the label when we're stuck inside the bottle, right? So if you want a subjective view from an outsider looking in, somebody who can read the bottle, somebody who's been there and done that, I'm going to ask that you engage in a complimentary business assessment call. What that will do is bring conscious awareness to any gaps that exist in your world. And let's face it. I mean, the first step to any positive change is awareness. I mean, we can't fix something if we don't know that it's broken, right? So our consultants who have been trained and certified by me specifically will help you identify any gaps that exist in your world. And once you've got a conscious awareness of that, then you can start to ask yourself the questions as to how to fix it. And of course, the quality of the question determines the quality of the answer. So until we talk again next time, everybody, I want you to be on purpose. Of course, I want you to be productive and as always, be powerful. I'm Sean Kokoska. Talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.